Today is uh, going to be a fun conversation. It's not going to be specific to uh, women, but to the home. Yeah. And the team was saying, hey, it's rare that we get Kristen up here. We have to kind of bribe her to get up here and uh, definitely have her work on her holiday. But and they were like, do some Q&A. And I don't know how you do that in a way that seems authentic and genuine. So the <laughs> idea was, well, what if we just put a bunch of questions in a fishbowl and you guys could just pull them out? And so They were I so am... weird last night. So. so question number one for Kristen. Oh, this is my favorite one. Is Mother's Day a romantic holiday? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Maybe Father's Day. You know, the Bible says uh, <laughs> Father's Day better be. <laughs> Amen. Uh. Scripture. <laughs> Scripture says Jesus stands at the door and knocks, and I'm just trying to be Christ-like. I'm looking for an open door. So. Oh, right. All right, let's see here. Next question. What do you think your last words will be? My last words? That's what the question is. <laughs> to like... You're on your deathbed, staring me in the eyes. <laughs> oh, to you? Uh, or to the kids, last words. Oh, I love you. See you oh, on the other right. side. I don't... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's see here. What is one thing about CJ you wish you could change? <laughs> Just one, one thing. One thing. Um, he's... I don't know if it's just you've gotten older, but I can hear him chewing his food now. <laughs> you know, like the crunching, he's horrible at chips. Um, it's just, in the notes, he doesn't use notes, so when he wa wants me to come up here, I'm like, you will use notes, that's also annoying. But um, One thing, just one uh, thing. Yeah. <laughs> one thing, all right, here we go. Next question. Uh, if you had my body for a day, <laughs> What would be the first thing you would do? If I had your for a day. These are some strange um, These are very strange. Just anything physical labor. Like I would be like, get the garage done, get the flower beds done. Anything that's going to break your back. I'm like, get it all done. Check it off. None of these questions are working in my favor. <laughs> hey. We're just going to jump into it. We are launching a series this week, and it's going to go on for the next uh, I think five or six weeks, yeah. and it's called As For Me and My House. Wave at me if you've ever heard that statement, As For Me and My House. Yeah, it's a, a declaration that we actually find in Scripture, and it's a declaration that our prayer, it, be, it becomes a declaration for your home. Yeah. And so in this series, we're going to be talking about family and the household, and we just would encourage you to lean in. We're all a part of a family, and there's no perfect family, and maybe God's Word has something to say about those things. And this statement comes from the book of Joshua. Now, Joshua is a hero of the faith. He's a legend in scripture. You could argue that he is the greatest military general in the entire Bible. What God does through him and the, the success that is granted to him is pretty impressive. And Joshua has the daunting task of following Moses. Moses is this iconic leader who leads the nation of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. God does wonderful things through his leadership. And then as Moses passes away, God taps Joshua on the shoulder. And it starts out in Joshua chapter one. The Lord says this to Joshua. He says, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. And then you will be prosperous and successful. Yeah, I mean, I love this verse. I love that we see this legendary leader, Moses, passing on and the Lord comes to Joshua and says, okay, you're up next. You can do this. You got this. In fact, the same way that um, God was with Moses, he will be with you. And I love that our God is a generational God. He was with the generation before us, he's gonna be with us, and he's gonna be with the generations long after us. He's such a good father. And I find comfort in that promise that he makes to all of us, that he will be with us, he will never leave us, and he will never forsake us. Yeah. Um, but know this, church, God is going to do this very same thing to you that he did to Joshua. And as we continue to follow him, there will be moments where the Lord will tap you on your shoulder and ask you to step out in faith. And God is clear, like he was to Joshua, I'm going to do amazing things in and through your life, but it's gonna require strength and courage. And what he means is, um, 
it's not gonna be easy, this life of faith, but it's gonna be worth it. Mm -hmm. And something we say often in our home is, when God demands more of you, it's because he sees more in you. Um, And chances are, God is calling you to step out in faith in areas of your life that may seem daunting, or may seem, come with some type of uncertainty. But I want you to take heart and courage and know that God will be with you and he will see you through it all and his word will come to pass in your life. Absolutely. Have you ever had like a prompting from God and you you wonder like, are you sure God, right? Mm -hmm. And what you find is every single one of us has a calling on our life. God has a design and a purpose and a plan for you. And a lot of times your calling will have you questioning your capacity. I don't know if I have what it takes. God specializes in bringing men and women to the end of themselves also that they can experience his full ability in and through their life. And what I've discovered, and maybe you can relate to this, is the road to confidence weaves through confusion. Now think about that. The road to confidence, it weaves through confusion. In other words, as you make your way towards establishing a sure foundation and understanding who you are in your relationship with God, it's gonna come with questions. It's gonna come with uncertainty. It's gonna come with even bouts of insecurity and doubt. But if you can make your way through those seasons of confusion, you find yourself uh, discovering God's ability to hardwire a rock solid confidence, a sure confidence in, in your identity and his plan Uh, for your life, but no, it does come with questions. And if you can't manage uncertainty, you will manufacture anxiety. If you just can't learn to accept that life is gonna come with some unknown uh, aspects, and that was certainly the case for, for Joshua. Be strong and courageous, I will be with you just as I was with Moses. Okay, God, but what happens next? And what you find is pretty fascinating. God does some amazing things in and through Joshua's story. But God doesn't tell him everything at once. He is tender in his mercy to give us one detail at a time. And what happens in the book of Joshua is, once again, God's remarkable resume and his faithfulness and his credibility to uphold his promise. Anyone just thankful for God's ability to uphold his promise and his willingness to do so? And at the end of Joshua's life, you get to Joshua chapter 24, and Joshua is addressing the the nation of Israel, at the time historically, the people of God. He's addressing the people of God for the last time. He's summarizing their journey. He's talking about all the things God has done in them and through them. He's also talking about the ways in which they've got it wrong and the times they've waffled. And he makes a a declaration at the end, a statement of explanation. Hey, this is uh, really what you should understand moving forward. And that's where we get our anchor verse. Verse 14 of chapter 24 Joshua says, now fear the Lord, in other words, have the utmost respect for him, and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshiped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Now watch this statement. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods the Amorites in in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Yeah, I mean, I love that statement. As for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. It comes with some swagger. And that's our hope throughout this whole um, sermon series is that you guys will begin to understand and develop some faith-filled, righteous resolve like Joshua had. The mindset that says, regardless of what others do and regardless of what the world endorses, As for me and my house, we're team Jesus. We are gonna devote our lives to serving him. And the overarching um, idea that we wanna land is great families don't happen by chance. They happen by choice. And God can and will do amazing things in and through your life, but you have to choose for your family who you will serve and how faithful you will be in that. Yeah, we always say a car in neutral never rolls uphill, right? You don't accidentally become great. Great families don't happen accidentally, but how many of you can attest that great families are filled with accidents? Yeah. You, know, you can be a great family and still have a lot of accidents, and that's certainly true of us. We, we come up short all the time. Yeah, you guys, CJ came up short so bad last week. <laughs> I'm like, oh. Last we're... week, our material is fresh. <laughs> no, it is. And like, moms, I need you to stay with me because you'll see. So last Tuesday, I was out of town, um, and CJ's, he's a good dad, he can jump in, and we're 50-50 here, but
But, you know, my boys have practice for basketball. They've had it at the same location for five weeks. And all of a sudden, CJ feels like... Let's give some more context just no. to, you know, level the jury a little bit. Uh, three kids have practices that night, and I also had an elder meeting and a trustee meeting that I was heading off to. But, but they go to the same the place every Tuesday, okay? It's not new. CJ decided to drop Miles, our youngest son, off at the wrong location. So he drops him off that wrong location, and he goes off to his little meeting. It is not for two hours that people realize, oh, Miles is not where he's supposed to be when they go to pick him up. So Miles is chilling at Mojo Up for two hours by himself, and no one knew. And so my mom's heart went dark really fast. And so... It was stressful, and luckily I was with one of my good friends who's a licensed psychologist, PhD, whatever. She's like, um, just so you know, he's showing signs of, what did she call it, secure attachment, where he's, he's fine being without you, and he's good. And I'm like, my son was alone for two hours, and no one knew it. He didn't call us. He did nothing. And then when I finally get CJ on the phone, he starts laughing. <laughs> He starts laughing. And Guys, like, these, these Hamilton County kids just stress me out. Their life is just so safe. It's like you're in this wonderful facility. You've been here before, and he thrived. I thought it was a win. <laughs> Mom, do you get with me, though? Like two hours by yourself doing nothing? He didn't call me? He didn't, I don't know. A show of hands if you're on my side. <laughs> oh, come on. I love it. It was only men who raised their hands, but... <laughs> You know, I, I love Joshua's leadership in this moment. Joshua gets to the end of his road and he's learned some hard lessons in leadership. And one of the hard lessons he learns is you can't force people to behave in a certain way. You can't make decisions for people. So he gets down the road and he says, hey, if this is undesirable to you, well, choose for yourself. And that word choose, if you go home and you do a word study and you talk about it in your small group, the word to choose there in the original language means to try and to decide. In other words, what Joshua is saying is, would you put some effort into this decision? You go ahead and you consider your options. You wanna you know, serve the gods of those beyond the Euphrates or you wanna serve the gods of Egypt or the gods of your ancestors. You choose, just put some effort into making this decision and you consider the options that are before you. But as for me in my house, uh, we are going to serve the Lord. And in many ways, what Joshua is doing is at the end of his road, he is given an explanation to the people that are around him. And he's saying, guys, if you look at my household and all that God has done in my life personally, and you wonder what is the driving force and the number one common denominator that is responsible for the good things that have taken place, he would say, it's because I anchored my life and I anchored my home and I anchored my family uh, to God. And this is one thing that we, we just love about you know, Northview is the ability to come alongside families. And you know, one thing that we are constantly trying to do ourselves is to elevate uh, our vision for our home. God, what is your vision for our family? Much of scripture is an invitation to consider that. And I would say this, when, when your perspective broadens on your decisions, your, your decisions and your behaviors get better. Does that make sense? Maybe a more clear way of saying it is our decisions and actions improve when our perspective on them gets broader. In other words, don't just do something nice for mom, consider how it affects dad. Don't just do the right things for your sibling, consider how it affects your parents. Don't just do the right things for your parents, consider how it affects your siblings. Don't just do the right things for your children, consider how it affects your grandchildren. And when you broaden your perspective on a decision, it in turn uh, improves your decision-making and your behaviors. And I think a great question for every single one of us is to constantly be praying, God, what is your vision uh, for our home? And God, would you give us, this is a statement we make often, a, a bigger vision to see a better version. Yeah. Lord, would you give us a bigger vision to see a better version of our home and our marriage and how we're raising our kids and what the generations to come would look like? Give us a bigger vision 
to see a better version. Yeah, and that's what I also love about what Northview does with the family framework. Like they are, our team is intentional about creating conversations and moments between parent and child about what their future looks like, what a vision for your family can look like. And one of my favorite vision verses comes out of the book of Deuteronomy, and it's Deuteronomy six through nine, and it says this. The commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children, Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them to your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates. And we've talked about this passage before and what it's essentially saying here, godly homes understand three things. Three things, symbol, um, speech, and surroundings, right? And for symbols, I love decorating my home. I know you women love decorating your home. Decorate it with whatever you want, hobbies, teams, do, do whatever, but make sure you have a symbol that your house is a faith-filled house and that God is represented in that. Secondly, in the terms of speech, um, I would consider how often do you bring up the Lord's conversation in your house? Like, do you just talk about the Lord on Sundays or is he someone who's a part of your daily conversations? You know, when we were growing up, we had the what would Jesus do bracelets. Those are coming back now because I just got Riley and Cannon some. But you guys just need to be intentional about just talking about Jesus like he's just a part of our daily conversations. Your kids come home with a problem or a struggle. It's like, oh, that's tough. How do you think Jesus would handle that? Hey, I don't, I don't know. What do you think? What does the Bible have to say about it? Bring him up in every conversation or try to be natural with it so that they know In the future, when you're not with them, they're going to go talk to him. And that's what we want. We want them talking to Jesus. And lastly, I would consider um, the surrounding environments you tend to occupy, your family tends to occupy the most. There are environments that support your faith, and then there are environments that challenge your faith. And you need to do an audit as a family of, hey, what type of environments are we surrounding our family in? And are there more environments that challenge our faith than don't? Like, we just want to make sure you you surround your family in godly environments where their faith can thrive and grow. Yeah, a recent study was showing that, you know, the average Christian now in America only attends church once a month. And that's just, you know, really an interesting statistic to consider. And I just think it is really hard to generate spiritual momentum with sporadic church attendance. You know, it's really hard to really see God's work in and through your family if you don't place yourself in environments that support and foster a greater faith and understanding of God's will. Yeah, Um, but there are three questions that we ask, um, are constantly asking and constantly evaluating. And the first one is, is our faith impressive or oppressive? Like, I want my kids to be inspired to follow Jesus, not forced to follow Jesus. And that comes with a whole different approach of how we present the gospel. Yeah, it's inspiration versus intimidation. And yeah. consider your witness. Are you trying to scare people into the faith or is your, your life with Christ compelling others to lean in in curiosity as to, hey, that's intriguing and that's compelling and I wanna experience what you have experienced firsthand. Yeah, secondly, what kind of human does our home produce? And this probably sounds old fashioned, but since the, um, the world we live in, I feel like we've lost a basic understanding of what decency, courtesy, gratitude, and respect look like. I want my little humans that I'm responsible for to be decent human beings and to be respectful and to be courtesy, like show respect to your elders. Like I don't want those virtues lost on them. So what type of home does our, um, what type of home our human does our home produce? Yeah, you know, and I just think the world desperately needs that, and we're, we're aware of that, and just trying to do our best individually and as families to say, hey, we are trying to be a part of the solution, not just adding to the problem within our world, and can we just send out into the world and our communities decent individuals who are good to other people? Absolutely. And then the third one is, what kind of Christian does our home produce? Yeah, which I think is fun. And I, you know, I probably think about this too much just because I'm a pastor and I love theology and philosophy. And I'm always considering with my kids, hey, where are they at on their spiritual journey? What kind of, you know, Christian is this right in front of me? And you can probably relate to this. Your, your kids are growing up and at times you, you just can notice their theology shifting and they're starting to learn what they understand about God and how they, you know, engage in their relationship with God. And right now I would say in our household, uh, Riley would be a Pentecostal. I think she's on the Pentecostal spectrum. <laughs> Cannon would be a Lutheran. Miles is, I mean, staunch Calvinist. He's like a very legalistic Baptist yeah. who is, I mean, he's, he's all the things with rules and lists. 
And I would probably say Presley might right now be a Catholic. She does daily confession and <laughs> just... Uh, Mandy, will you put that picture up? I forgot to show them. Oh, this is our... So you have some faces that go yeah. with the labels, but it's somewhere in there. Maybe they'll have it. Maybe not. Okay. Well, they're just so cute. Oh, look at them. Riley's 14, Cannon's 12, Miles is 11, and Presley is 5. I mean, look at Miles. You can just... There's something. He's a little mischievous. Yeah, if he one. ever preaches at North, you just know it's going to be hellfire, brimstone. Yeah, yeah like, he's coming for you. Everyone's repenting. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, th this idea of, of choosing, hey, choose today, make a decision. And today we want to kind of give just some specifics as to, hey, four things maybe you could consider choosing and four things that in our home we say, let's choose this yeah. uh, on an ongoing basis moving forward. And one thing would be to choose truth. And I don't know what it's like for you, but I, I tend to look at things and I get stressed out. And one of them uh, would be airplanes. And I am always stressed by the size of wheels that are on an airplane. Come on, wave at me if you've ever looked at an airplane and thought, those tiny little wheels, this thing's gonna come <laughs> crashing down from the sky at hundreds of miles per hour. And those little training wheels are going to somehow <laughs> catch it. And it, you don't happen. think they would work, but they work. And I say all that because I think a lot of people uh, look at God's word in a similar fashion. They, they view it as a book among many, yeah. and they don't really recognize it as uh, God's written and inspired relevant word that is uh, sharper than a double-edged sword, and it is living, and it is active, and it is the source of truth. And you may view it as insignificant, but you discover over time you truly can build your life upon the word of God. Yeah. In fact, I think it is the surest foundation available to any one of us. And 2 Timothy chapter 4 says this in verse 3. It says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passion. So if, if you don't like what a, a preacher is teaching out of the Bible, you can just go jump on YouTube or you can go jump on Google or download some podcast and find someone somewhere in the world who will support your opinion and support your passion. And he's saying that's what is going to happen. And they will turn away from listening to the truth and, and wander off into myths. And you know, Chris and I, we, we hear this pushback from our peers and certainly individuals who are younger than us, and they will consider our approach or maybe our uh, position in life, and they'll say, well, that's just so old-fashioned. And I actually receive that as a compliment because they don't make things the way they used to, and I would rather drive a 65 Mustang than a 2025 Mustang. Can I get an amen? <laughs> like, it's just a better vehicle. And uh, so I just think recognizing that there is something solid about our faith and learning to anchor your life in the word of God. And one thing we say often in our home, and maybe uh, this is something you could consider in adopting, and that is God's boundaries for your life are God's blessings for your life. And we want uh, our kids to grow up understanding and appreciating the gift that is conviction. A lot of people have a terrible understanding of conviction. It is an absolute gift. It is not for you to be guilted. It is for you to be guided. Yeah. And it is God's tender mercy and the Holy Spirit's ability to come alongside you, tapping you on the shoulder, pointing you in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. We not only want our kids to know the truth of God's word, we want them to understand the importance of integrity and living truthful lives. Um, I love what Proverbs says about this. It says, Proverbs 3, 1 through 6 says, My sons, do not forget my teachings, but keep my commands on your heart, for they will prolong your life many years, bringing you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck and write them on tablets of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understandings. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. And I love what verse four says, then you will win favor in a good name. The word win implies there's some type of contest out there. And essentially it's saying in life, um, you're going to be challenged and you're gonna be contested, just how life is. But if you stay to the course and you maintain your integrity through it all eventually, and it may take time because people need convincing, you will earn favor and a good name. Yeah, and it's so interesting how much you see this dynamic played out and addressed all throughout Scripture. In fact, Jesus might be the greatest example of it. Scripture says Jesus came full of grace and truth. And what do we discover in the life of Jesus? 
Love attracts a lot of hate and truth attracts a lot of lies. And if you're gonna live anchored in the truth, living for the truth, just know that it comes with a, an unexpected resistance for many people, especially early on in their relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's just learning to anchor yourself in integrity, anchor yourself in the truth. And I love what uh, Peter said. You know, Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse uh, 16, he says, keeping a clear conscience, but you can't put a price on a clear conscience. In fact, I would say a clear conscience is the secret to a good night's sleep. And I would say integrity is the key to a clear conscience. Mm -hmm. And the other beautiful thing about integrity is you don't have to have a good memory. I and mean, you just stand in the truth. You don't have to run around trying to keep it all together. <laughs> he says, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Scripture's telling us that life in the truth comes with these weird dynamics that you wouldn't expect. And we see it represented in Christ and we see it talked about all throughout scripture. But what is beautiful about the end of the Bible is what is the final book in scripture? The book of Revelation is this wonderful, magnificent vision. And chapter 12, verse 10 of it, John writes, then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down. Essentially what scripture is saying is, you know, it's hard to live a life of integrity. It's gonna take some work. You're gonna have to develop some righteous resolve. But in the end, rooting yourself in the truth and integrity it is so worth it. And it, it's the one thing that gives you the ability to stand under extreme pressures in this life. And there's this quote by Peter Marshall that we've joked about. Peter Marshall once said in a prayer, he says, Lord, where we are wrong, make us willing to change. So if you're talking about the truth, one thing that we have to acknowledge and accept is not a single one of us is perfect. We all come up short. We all make mistakes. Lord, where we are wrong, give us the ability and the willingness to change. And where we are right, make us easy to live with. I love that. Let's not be the type of person who swells up in pride yeah. with the I told you so moments, but just living humbly in the truth. Absolutely. Next in our house, we want to choose faithfulness. Hebrews 10, 23 says, let us unswervingly, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess that he who promised is faithful. Um, and Billy Grahams has this quote that I love. It says, the greatest legacy one can pass on to one's children and grandchildren is not money or other material things accumulated in one's life, but rather a legacy of character and faith. And that is so true. We are always telling our kids, life with Christ is not about going the fast, fastest, it's about going the furthest. Like living a faithful life, it takes your whole life. And you don't wanna be a Christian who's like, I'm faithful when it's good, but I'm not faithful when it's bad. No, you, are, you need to be faithful no matter what season of life you're in. Unfaithfulness um, is a long obedience in the same direction. It's long and you're going the same direction your entire life. Yeah, some of the most uncomfortable things Jesus ever said were in the conversations regarding discipleship. And he would tell people to consider the decision that they were making, not to impulsively you know, jump into this, uh, but to actually think it through. And he once said in Luke chapter 14, he says, for which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him. And tragically, we see a lot of people, you know, throwing in the towel on their faith. And the, the challenge is to think more critically and to plan accordingly that if I'm going to live for Christ, I'm gonna do it for the rest of my life. And I'm, I'm committing to a life of faithfulness. And to share another Miles story. He's getting a lot of airtime today. Yeah. He's but, given us a lot of material lately. Yeah, you know, around the in probably age of five or six, Miles is now 11, Miles started saying, I wanna be an engineer, which surprised me because I don't have a single skill set that would have inspired <laughs> such a thing. And he's been wanting to be an engineer. So recently, we found out his school offers a robotics club, you know, starting next year as he enters into uh, fifth grade. And so, we're like, buddy, this is gonna be so great. You're, you're joining this robotics club and, and I, I probably tend to overdo the inspiring pep talks. And so I'm like, buddy, you're gonna be like the next Iron Man and you're gonna be building robots. I'm sharing all this stuff. And he immediately pushed back and he goes, I don't wanna build them. 
And I was like, well, what does that mean? What's the point of you going to a robotics club? And he said, no, here's the problem. All you old people are building all these robots and all this AI stuff, and then you're gonna die, and you're gonna leave the rest of us with a world full of robots. And he goes, I don't wanna beat up, build them. I wanna know how to beat them. I wanna know how to like shut them off when you guys are gone and in heaven. Yeah. And, um, Isn't that crazy? It was hilarious, but so he's, he's planning for the future. And um, <laughs> I just think if you're gonna live a life for Christ, you, you just gotta plan for the future. <laughs> yes, um, Miles, it's one of my favorite Miles stories. Um, also, we want to choose joy for our household. I want my kids to come home and it feel safe and it feel joyful to them. Um, scripture tells us that joy is one of the fruits of the spirit, which is interesting because all of us, um, Throughout my years of ministry and being a Christian, I'm surprised by how few people actually view joy as a mark of spiritual maturity. Like, I don't know why, like, joy doesn't get more press. Um, I think it is because um, most people think that people who are joyful have easier lives. Like, oh, they're just joyful because they're not going through anything which we're all going through something. No one is exempt from a hard and difficult life, yeah. whether you're joyful or not. I think the ones that are some of the strongest people you'll ever meet are the ones who have a smile on their face because they're going through it just like you, but they're able to hold that joy and see past their circumstances or what they're walking through at that time. Um, we, I wrote it down this way. Joy is not immature, but joy is impressive. Yeah. It's a hard thing to pull off, but if you have it, in any season, it's very impressive. Yeah, C.S. Lewis, who wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, but a bunch of theology books and philosophy books, and was just a brilliant man, he, he once said, joy is the serious business of heaven. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a great thought? Joy is the serious business of heaven, that God cares deeply about your joy. In fact, he sent Jesus Christ, and the first announcement of his son's arrival was joy to the world, which is a, a great gift and benefit to you and I, because what that means is joy is not something we develop. Joy is something Jesus delivered. Yeah. So it's not something you and I achieve. It's simply something we receive. In Christ, we have anchored ourselves not to a fleeting emotion like happiness, but to something greater such as joy. Yeah. And joy, again, it, it's a choice. It's, it's an outlook, and your outlook often determines the outcome. Yeah. And we see this, again, demonstrated and exemplified in Christ. Hebrews chapter 12 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And I just think that is such an interesting thing to think about that it says, for the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross. That, Like Kristen is saying, you have to be able to look past your, your fleeting and changing circumstances and to anchor yourself to something deeper and greater. And it is an interesting thing to think about, but it is represented in Christ and it can be replicated in, in our lives if we take him at his word. And I once heard this theologian said that if you have no joy, uh, there's a leak in your Christianity. If you have no joy, there's a leak in your Christianity. Yeah, life comes with some challenges, but my goodness, God's faithfulness and all the ways in which he is good to us should overshadow those things, and we anchor ourselves yeah. uh, to that reality. And uh, Proverbs 17, 22 says, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. And here, here's the thing. Uh, you're going to go through hard times. Your, your family's going to face some trials. And what you discover is those who enjoy being together can endure tough times together. When there is a, a equity built up within the, the family and within the household, when you have the ability to enjoy being around one another, you have the ability to then endure tough times with one another. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, for our house, we want to choose peace. The Bible says a lot about peace, um, and we can boil it down to three categories, and I do believe it's in this order. One, the peace with God, the peace with ourselves, and peace with others. You know, I want my home, when my kids to come, come home, I want them to feel safe and at peace, no matter what they're going through, that I can help them to find peace with God, 
peace with themselves and helping them find peace with others. Um, Jack Wallman said it this way, no one can have peace with God until, or no one can have peace of God until they have peace with God. And I think that's so powerful. And here's the good news, because what Christ has done for us on the cross, we can have peace with our heavenly father. God has extended peace to all of us. All we have to do is receive the peace that is found through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He gives it to us. He grants it to us. In Philippians 4, 6 through 7, it says this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's such a good verse. And funny story, which probably has nothing to do with the verse, but uh, Philippians chapter four, you know, when I was 18, my parents had this rule in the household that you couldn't have any tattoos or any ear piercings until you were 18. You're an adult, you can make your own decision. So I turn 18, I go right down to the tattoo shop. I'm getting this tattoo. And at the time I wasn't living for the Lord, but I still was gonna get a, a cross with this Bible verse. And so I, the guy puts the print on my arm and it, it was a cross and it had Philippians 4, verse 13, uh, for I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Maybe one of the most out of context and abused verses <laughs> all the time. But he puts the verse on my arm. He's this big burly biker guy, big beard. And he, he sits down and throws out some profanity and, and says, now don't move. And I'm terrified of needles. And right before he starts, I, I panic. And I was like, I can't do it. I can't do it. And uh, he's looking at me like, are you serious? I said, no, I, I just can't do it. I'm sorry. And so I leave and I go home. And my mom, which shout out to her, happy Mother's Day, mom. And she says, all right, well, well let me see it. And I said, well, I, I didn't end up getting the tattoo. I, I panicked at the last minute, but the print is still on my arm. This is what I was gonna get. And I pull up my sleeve and my mom looks at it and she goes, CJ, he misspelt Philippians. Can you imagine if oh, I, I had, a, as a pastor, it. a misspelt Bible verse I would have loved on my it. arm? I would have made so much fun. So maybe the takeaway is always spell check your tattoo artist, <laughs> and not everybody gets to label you permanently. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, I'll end with this. You know, when it comes to the peace conversation, you know, sometimes when you bump into a, a concept in the Bible, something to consider is what is this being associated with? So when you bump into peace, ask the question, in this context, uh, theologically, in this narrative, uh, what is this being associated with? And what you'll find all throughout the Bible is peace is not so much associated with comfort. It's associated with courage. It's an interesting idea. You know, Joshua, we just read, hey, be strong and courageous. And what scripture wants us to know is when you have peace within your heart, when, when you know you have peace and you've been reconciled to God through the finished work of the cross, that you've been robbed of your shame and you don't have to carry all this guilt and yeah. feelings of lack of worth and self-deprecation. And when you have peace with yourself and you fully receive God's forgiveness and redemption in your life, and you are now living uh, as a conduit of that peace and grace towards other people, it actually produces a, a courage in your life. Uh, to just go out there peacefully, being true to yourself and true to the God that you serve. And that is the charge. Jesus in his famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter five said, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. That one of the surest signs that you and I are on our way to heaven, one of the surest signs that you and I are a child of the most high king is we are peacemakers. Yeah. And the world is full of peace breakers. We, we see those everywhere, people who are disruptive and divisive and deceptive. Uh, the world is also full of peace fakers, individuals who have malicious intent, but they have a way of disguising it. Uh, scripture would call them wolves in sheep's clothing. Uh, but we are called to be peacemakers, individuals who uh, just represent Christ and his reconciliation in the world. And it's a beautiful thing. And uh, again, like Joshua says, uh, you can't force a person to make a decision. You, you choose for yourself, um, but maybe, just maybe, you find the benefit of anchoring your life to Christ, amen?